Good morning and uh, thanks for the opportunity to present some of the work I've done over the last year. I guess this work was done for GRDC, um, basically trying to answer a series of questions about how much is the climate changing and how is that affecting um, sorghum production in the CQ, or for this point of view, for within CQ. Um, I'm really sorry I'm not there with you. I was hoping to run this as a fairly interactive session um, where we could talk and uh, uh, use shared experiences to actually come to some idea as to what is happening within the climate, within the area. But unfortunately, um, I took a bit of a spill on the weekend and uh, I'm not really in a position and weren't not allowed to be in aeroplanes for... Um, another six to eight weeks. So um, I'll, I'll move on from that kind of ugly shot and get on with the talk. So is the climate changing and are we, or are we just observing variability? I guess this is one of the questions I had in the back of my head. But before I get started, one of the methods I've used is what's called the climate normal concept. Now this is the Bureau of Meteorology or the World Bureau of Meteorology as a way of coming up with saying, you know, how big a chunk of time can you use to decide whether something is different? I guess, so what they've, what they've said is that 30 years is a big enough chunk of time to account for droughts, um, flooded, you know, flood areas, where if you use a, say, a 10 year period, you know, three of those years may be affected by drought. And so you'll get a lot more variability where they're saying by using 30 years, you statistically, you can pull out a lot of that variability. And so when you start to see changes between 30 year chunks, then you can start saying that there is um, uh, merit in that that is an actual real change and not just an artifact of variability. Okay, give you a rough idea of this. I'm not sure whether you can see my mouse. I've broken the climate uh, normals into uh, five. The first climate normal, which basically runs from 1948 through to 1980, uh, 1977 is I tend to ignore, mainly because this first 10 year period of it was before automatic weather stations were uh, used within Australia. And so there's a lot of variability within that. So I'd put more weight, if you look at these, on the climate normal two through to five. Later in this presentation, I will show just a direct comparison between um, climate normal two and climate normal five, which is the first, which is basically the last 60 years. So broken into two chunks, the first 30 years versus the second 30 years. Now I'm assuming that since I'm roughly the average age of Australian farming, a farmer due to the Bureau of Statistics, most of you have, a majority of you sitting there are probably have experienced at least one of these climate normals, probably this last one, and degrees of this second one. Um, there's probably a few of you who have experienced all of it, those of you who are over 60. But those of us who are just getting close to 60 have experienced a fair amount of this one and all of this one. So it is always good to use your own experiences and intuition and observations into understanding what's going on. So how is the Capella environment changing? First sort of thing I did was just grab the Capella MET file and broke it into those climate normals. And the first thing I did was just look at annual rainfall. So this is the sum of annual rainfall. And if we forget this first one, because I think it's gonna have a lot more variability in it, but if we just look at these last four, you can really see over the last 60 years, there hasn't been a great deal of variability in annual rainfall. Do start to notice that the box plots as we move to the more recent, so from 
1978 through to about 2017, the box plots are starting to get a little larger, which does mean you're getting greater variability. But realistically, not a lot of change. If we break that into uh, cropping seasons, so here I've just broken the annual cycle into two six monthly sections, both basically a summer one and a winter one, you can start to see that there, there was a tendency for a decline in summer, but it seems to have picked up, but with a lot more variability in more recent years. And likewise, a bit of a decline in um, median rainfall in the winter months. But realistically, there's not a lot in it. It's pretty, um, pretty flat. So let's look at temperature. So what I've done here is used um, basically a, de a day degree method. So for each day, I've got the average temperature. So if today, if it was 15 degrees this morning and it got to 25 degrees today, it's 40, our average is 20, okay? Now, what I've done is accumulated that for a whole year. So if today was 20 and tomorrow was 20, we're now at 40 and I just keep accumulating every day of the year. So after, and I do that for the whole 300 and, uh, for the whole 30 year period. So you, it's a massive just accumulation. But what you can see from that is that on our, that the temperatures in the, um, say from 1958 to 1987 were a lot cooler across a year, it was a lot cooler in, in the heat sum across the whole year than what it is in more recent times. But really there's not a lot of difference in the last 40 years, which so between 1978 and 2017. Again, I've broken that into, into um, both summer and winter. And again, this time it's quite interesting that yes, there is, it's, it's a very similar pattern in summer, but quite a distinct pattern in winter that the temperatures are warming, that there is more heat um, in, within the system during the winter months. Okay. One of the things lots of people talk about with climate change is more extreme events. One of the ways I've done this is to look at temperatures above 35 degrees. So I've gone through the MET file, basically exactly as we've uh, done for the rainfall and um, temperature, and I've just counted every time there was an occurrence over 35 degrees, a, a day over 35 degrees. And what you get to see there is, there is a slight trend that yes, as you are uh, going from 1957 through to um, 2017, that you are getting a slight increase. It sort of increases up to the, uh, the 1978-2007 climate normal, and then is fairly flat from then on. So that's, and if I apply that to a winter months, there are more and more days over 35 occurring in winter than what there has historically been. But, and likewise, you can see in summer that it has increased or, and is sort of flattening off at this uh, current, current time. Right, so that's a general summation of the Capella region met file. Okay, I've done that for lots of areas right across Australia, or right down the eastern seaboard. And I'm really only showing you the northern New South Wales, southern Queensland sites, because I've broken those into two transects. A western transect, which Capella will lie on, and uh, an eastern transect. So here, you can see the transects down the, the two transects, the eastern and western transect. And you can see each town put in in order as you move down that transect. And across the bottom, we have the months. And the what we're showing is the median rainfall. What I've done here is taken the difference. 
So the difference between the most recent climate, 30 years, and the previous 30 years. So back, if we look back at our um, breakdown here, I am taking the this climate normal and this uh, away from this climate normal. Okay. So what that shows is if there is a difference. So the idea, if there is, if we're negative, that means there is less rainfall than what they're in um, now, in the more recent climate normal, than there was in the past. So anywhere that is red has had less rainfall than what they're, less monthly rainfall than there was um, historically. So, the, so the general picture is for there's less rainfall, but if the more blue it is, is where it's positive, and there's an increase in rainfall, the more red is a decrease in rainfall, and the, where it's yellowy, orangey, pink, um, that's fairly neutral. It's a little bit either way. You can see the actual numbers there, and we're sort of talking, you know, these uh, yellow numbers, you're talking 0.8 of a mil or four mils, where the more heavily red or blue is where you're talking 14 mils or, or 20 mils. So overall, if we're looking up here near Claremont, um, I'm not sure why Springshaw has fallen off that figure. It's meant to be there. But um, if we're looking up here, it's fairly neutral. We've got this one big red blob. I'm not quite sure what's happening there in February. It seems to be very dry. But we'll look at that more closely when we break things down by crop. Likewise, if we look at temperature, here the colours have swapped around. So if the temperature has increased, it's red. If the temperatures have decreased, they're blue. So if the temperatures are hotter in the more recent climate normal than the historic climate normal, then it's red. And generally we have an overall red pattern and it's not a huge amount. Um, so if we look at Claremont, we're looking at about an average daily temperature of 0.4 of a degree increase, which is this one or about a one degree, which is the one beside it. So that's a June, July. So that gives you some idea. All of these are in your notes. So how will this affect sorghum production? If we look at sorghum production following exactly the same colour scheme, blue means an increase, red means a decrease. You can start to see at Claremont, Claremont and Springshaw around this area, there's a bit of a decrease, a bit of an increase in Springshaw. So, you know, at Capella, you're probably in between there. So you're gonna have some, win, some wins, some losses. Along the bottom are the months with which we sow. So whether you're sowing from, and we've done sowing from the 1st of August right the way through to the 15th of February. All of these were sown on a full profile. So we gave the best chance to have a crop. That's got it going in on a totally full profile. I know that's very artificial, but we've gone in on a full profile and it's only the temperature or rainfall that could have caused a difference. And you can see that there are differences. Claremont, you're losing out a little bit, 0.3 of a tonne. It's very yellowy, so it's really in that neutral phase. Likewise in Springshaw, it's still in that yellowy neutral phase, but it's just a little more blue. So as you've gone from Claremont to Springshaw, there's not a lot of difference in it, but there it's fairly neutral. So yields really probably haven't changed much. As I said, I did that on a full profile. A full profile is fairly artificial. So here we've seen the same thing where we've sown the crop only on 100 millimetres of soil water. So this is making the assumption that you've got two feet of mud or two feet of wet soil when you planted the crop. 
you'll see a lot of black there, they're failed crops. So if you couldn't get more than 50% of the years with a return with a crop that um, returned, and I think I used about uh, I did a gross margin summary. I think it was about 800 kilos for sorghum. So unless you got 800 kilos, it was declared a failed crop. So you can start to see there um, certain sowing dates fall out straight away, as do whole um, regions. You know, Mung and I on 100 mils of water, you just don't sow, which is why most of the growers I work with in those areas use a trigger of about 150 mils as their bottom level, and they'll plant anything above that. If we follow that through, um, so if we took each one of those crops and we just said, well, how much rain fell while those crops were in the ground, you can start to see that it's really over here at Claremont and Springshire, it's not that much different to what we were looking at when we were looking at the annual rainfall. It's, yes, there is a, a few specific sowing dates that have less rainfall, um, and there's a few that seem to have picked up a bit more rainfall. So, you know, looking at those October, November sowing dates, they might be a little bit better. Moving on. Likewise, I've done exactly the same. Oh, I've gone the wrong way. Sorry. Here we are. If we've done the measurements, monthly rainfall. Sorry, sorry about that. I'll blame the drugs. They must be kicking in. Um, here we are looking at temperature. So exactly the same thing. We're looking through rainfall, uh, looking through uh, temperatures at different sowing dates and how they occur. And you can see in Claremont that yes, certain sowing dates, the temperature is much higher now than what it was in the past. So trying to find a temperature, and this is temperature at flowering, which Graham Hammer and lots of the research they've done is showing high temperatures at flowering are what's causing sorghum to use, lose yield. So it does show there are a few months around here which are relatively you know, neutral or not as bad, and some months that are much higher in having high temperatures during flowering. So in conclusion, increasing temperatures and reducing rainfall have lowered the yield potential of sorghum. So generally, because we've got higher temperatures, crops use more water, there's more days above 35 degrees during flowering, which are going to affect flowering and seed set. Um, and all of that combined will lower the yield potential. However, by having plenty of water in the system, you can overcome some of that. So changing the trigger and ensuring you have more water in the soil can overcome some of that yield loss. You are still going to have a yield loss even if you have a full profile. But, but not planting on your bottom margin, if you increase the bottom margin a bit, you can have some compensation. Most of this, if you look at Svee Hockland's work on yield gaps, there's still quite a big yield gap for sorghum within the farming, within the, the CQ regions. And so this is suggesting that there is still lots of other areas that we can improve and maintain yield within the sorghum crop um, to improve things. Um, so yeah, there is still room to improve. So with that, I'll say thank you. There is one thing I wanted to say. Lots of people have said, is CQ, you know, is Gundawindi now going to be the new CQ? Well, if you look at this, this is back looking at all the yields from the Eastern and the Western transect put side by side and basically showing, and if you look at the color, darker colors are higher yields. You can still see Claremont and Springshaw still have 
higher yields and much higher yields than Gundawindi. The same colours are used. So yes, even though climate the climate is uh, reducing our yield potential, it has not reduced it to a point where the sorghum, the optimum sowing sorghum growing districts have shifted south. They have all moved a little bit and have swapped around, but those areas that were, were great sorghum growing areas are still great sorghum growing areas. Okay, with that, I'll thank you and I hope this hasn't been too painful to listen to. Um, and hopefully when I'm back up on my legs, I will uh, come up to CQ and I'd love to discuss any of it with you. Thanks.